Dan Pollock is the Director of Government Relations for the Zionist Organization of America. He has been with the ZOA since 2007. Dan helps educate members of Congress, their staffs, and other government officials on the relationship between the United States and Israel, as well as on policies and issues relating to the Middle East. Dan has been instrumental in the fight against the appointment of Chaz Freeman as the chairman of the National Intelligence Council early in the Obama administration, the continuing struggle to prevent Iran from achieving military nuclear capability, and the effort to get decision makers to understand that the Palestinian Authority has not lived up to any of its commitments in the many agreements it has signed with Israel. Dan was a submarine officer in the United States Navy. He enjoyed a 25-year career in the information technology industry, was an IT executive for the Bank of America. Dan has an MS in computer science from NJIT and a BS in mathematics and statistics from Miami University in Oxford. Dan and I are colleagues, and I'm glad to say that we're now good friends. The title of our program, again, is an inside look at ZOA's work on Capitol Hill, educating Congress on the truth about Arab-Islamic war against Israel and other matters affecting Jews. Hey, Dan, how are you doing? Hey, thanks. Great. Great to be here, and I'm so pleased everyone showed up for this. Well, we're glad you're here and looking forward to a great program. Let's start at the very beginning, Dan. It's a very good place to start. I don't know if you catch that reference, but there you are. You're the director of the government relations at ZOA. What does that mean? And can you tell our audience what your day-to-day -day life looks like as the director? Thanks. So what it means is I'm, the, I'm in charge of our relations with our government here in Washington. I run the Washington office. My day-to-day -day work, very briefly, is about uh, meeting with members of Congress and their staffs. Uh, I physically schedule meetings with Democrats and Republicans. Of course, COA is a nonprofit, is a nonpartisan organization, in addition to being a nonprofit. And uh, we try to educate members from both parties about issues relating to Israel. On any given day, I might talk to um, uh, anywhere from three to six staff people in a one-on-one in -on -one meeting, and sometimes by phone and email. And I also attend uh, a lot of what people are doing today. I do in-person meetings like this with other think tanks and both to hear what they have to say and to express COA's point of view and the questions. So one other thing I wanted to say, hopefully this discussion will be at a, uh, we have a pretty informed audience. If we end up going too quickly through something, we don't wanna waste a lot of time telling people things they already know but the risk there is that somebody may not get a reference I'm making. In that case, please go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll try to cover it during the question and answer. Great, Dan, thanks for that overview. Let's dive right in. At ZOA, we're not afraid to call out the enemies of Israel and the Jewish people. ZO, ZOA's position on anti-Semitic Israel haters like Elon Omar and Rashida Tlaib is clear. But there's also concern about broader anti-Semitism in Congress. Is this a legitimate concern? Yes, I think it is. The last uh, year in particular has been tough. In addition to what people probably already know about Omar and Talib, we have Representative uh, Betty McCollum from Minnesota. She introduced with 27 co-sponsors, uh, a bill to protect the human rights for Palestinian children living under, human, under Israel uh, military occupation. It's just a ludicrous, ludicrous bill. Now, I'm not saying that each of those 27 is an anti-Semite. That's not fair. Some of them are just really, really badly informed. But we do have Representative Hank Johnson from Georgia, who in 2016 called the Jews in Judea and Samaria termites. We have really a problem with the type of irrational outburst that would be punished against any other group uh, gets completely uncommented on when the charge is made against Jews or Israel. Now, let me give you an example. Um, the Republicans have a congressman named Steve King, who has been accused, probably with some justification, 
of having some white supremacist views. He used to be an ally of ZOA, but we've cut off all contact with him. After he said his latest extremely unacceptable thing, the Republican leadership removed him from all of his committees. They passed a resolution unanimously condemning him by name for the outrageous conduct that he engaged in. When following Representative Omar's essentially equivalent outburst about Jews, instead, the Democratic majority in the House would not pass a resolution that condemned him, and they failed to uh, remove him from committees. So basically, there really is a problem. I want to say one more thing that isn't well enough known about this. There's a group called MIFTA. And if I were interacting with you in person, I would ask how many people in the audience have heard of it? If so, give a wave or something. But it's, it should be a household name amongst pro-Israel activists. This is the group that was going to sponsor the trip to Israel that Omar and Talib were not allowed to take because Israel wouldn't admit them in the summer of 2019. But this group, founded by Hanan Ashrari, who some of you may remember, she was a big name in the Palestinian leadership um, a few years ago. She founded it. Oh, by the way, she used to date Peter Jennings, little known fact, same woman. Uh, this group in 2013 had on their website a statement that the blood libel that Jews use in the making of Passover matzah was actually true. She, the, the author called to task people who said that it was just a myth. And they didn't take it down right away. When they finally did take it down, they only took it down off the English language website and apologized, and then finally took it down from the Arabic as well. In addition, there have been numerous articles on the same website praising uh, suicide bombers. There's one named Wafia Idris, who they said was a role model for women all over the Arab world, for example. And when this trip to Israel was planned, I mean, I could talk about this for an entire webinar itself. They were going to meet with the PFLP group in Israel. It was on their agenda yeah. called the Children's International for Palestine. And uh, things like that are completely unacceptable if any other group was trying to uh, do it and escape sanction. I think that answers the question. It really is a problem. Um, well, thank you for the answer. I have so many follow-up questions, Dan, but in the interest of getting through our material, I bet that we'll get questions about some of your response in the questions in, from the audience. Next question is, with little or no exception, everyone in Congress claims to be pro-Israel. But if you'll allow me a slight to slightly modify the business principle of caveat emptor and change it to let the voter beware, how do we know which Congress people truly are pro-Israel? And a follow-up to that, um, if you feel you can answer this, are the Democratic Party, is it still pro-Israel in general? Let me answer the last one first. Yes, I think it is. Uh, during that same summer that uh, Talib and Omar were going to go to Israel last summer, uh, more than 30 Democrats went on a trip together to Israel, and they did it in a pro-Israel way. So um, it's very common for most every member of Congress with a small number of exceptions to consciously identify themselves as pro-Israel. Uh, the problem is, where does that start and where does it end? So for things like missile defense, support for Israel against Iran, it's pretty common to get and receive good, solid, of course, I'm, I wanna be pro-Israel. The problem is that for some people who are what we would consider anti-Israel, they also couch it in pro-Israel terms. So some people may be aware of this week, a uh, senator from California, um, mental blocking her name, Diane Feinstein, one of our Jewish members of the Senate. Uh, she used pro-Israel language in sending a letter 
to uh, Israel, the Israeli ambassador, telling them not to dare do annexation, which would be horrible for the Jewish people and for Israel, which he calls annexation. We'll talk about that in, in a minute, maybe. But the point is, is when you do something that any of us would consider anti-Israel, they also crouch it, crouch it in pro-Israel language. ZOA has some tough challenges here. We oppose the establishment of a Palestinian Arab terror state. Therefore, what some people call the two-state solution, we don't call it that because it's a murderous um, distortion of the English language to call it a solution. Uh, that's completely unacceptable to ZOA. And there are only a few members of Congress who even understand the distinction between um, you know, being pro-Israel, but also not being in favor of the so-called two-state solution. Here's some of the insider information I'm gonna give you. Politicians hate a problem that doesn't have an easy solution. And if you can define a problem without an easy solution in the world, it's the Arab-Israeli conflict, right? So politicians often identify with the conventional wisdom solution as their fallback answer, rather than admit that they don't really know how to solve a problem. So it's a little bit harder to say, well, these problems are insurmountable and there's no solution to them right now. Politicians hate to say that. Um, there, there is an, a generational divide. There are some old time democratic leaders. For example, you know, we all are familiar with Schumer and Representative Engel, who really are, you know, a history of pro-Israel activism. Some of them are being pushed by the changes in the Democratic Party. For example, Nadler from New York, a congressman, who has a long history of being pro-Israel, a Jewish guy again. He didn't vote on the Holocaust education bill that recently passed the House and the Senate. One can just speculate as to why he didn't want to vote. I'm pretty sure the reason is, is that he would get some criticism in his district and doesn't want to endanger his seat before the primary. So just give you a thought experiment. Imagine another war with Lebanon coming up in the near future. Unfortunately, we think that Israel would be in for a lot of criticism for reasonable steps of self-defense from people who are being pushed to be more critical of Israel. I want to say one more thing here. The, the Republicans are not without sins either. What ZOA would like is a bipartisan pro-Israel Congress where everyone is pro-Israel. But that doesn't really fit in with the Republican political objectives. The way they see it, and it's not unreasonable from their point of view, they have a partisan advantage that Jewish people in particular, and everyone who's pro-Israel, which is a lot more than Jewish people, we have a lot of pro-Israel Christians in this country, ought to appreciate that Republicans are going to be better for Israel than Democrats. And so every time APAC, for example, says we need a bipartisan foreign policy, uh, that's not something that is really in the best interests of Mitch McConnell. He wants to make hay from the actual differences that exist. Go ahead. Next. Um, thank you for that answer. It actually dovetails nicely into my next question, Dan, because we're going to talk about um, one of the presumptive nominees. The Palestinian Authority and Mahmoud Abbas continue to name streets and parks and holidays after terrorist murderers who killed Jews. We know that the presumptive Democratic presidential candidate nominee Joe Biden recently stated that he favors restoring funding to the PA, would reopen the U.S. consulate in Eastern Jerusalem, and would seek to reopen the PLO mission in Washington. With the projected composition of the Houses of Congress, would he be able to pull all of this off? We'll have to see. The presidency is tremendously powerful. And the, as we can see from President Trump exercising his discretion in what to do, there's a lot that he can do all by himself, even without the support of Congress. And we need to remember that uh, in the words of <clears throat> Congressman Sherman, when he was speaking to some ZOA people, when asked, uh, he's a Democratic Congressman from California, when he was asked about what a Biden presidency would be like, 
he said, I don't want to quote him exactly, but he's something to the effect that, well, it was the Obama-Biden administration that we had before President Trump. So he doesn't really expect, and I don't think we should, that they're going to be very different from the attitude of President Obama. But maybe there can be some slight improvements. The issue for President Biden, if he should become so, would be that we have uh, laws on the books that would actually make some of that difficult. For example, reestablishing the PLO mission in Washington is prohibited as long as the Palestinian Authority is pursuing action at the International Criminal Court, the ICC. Well, they are. So he would either have to change that law or ignore it to open up their mission again. ZOA's strategy for the entire Trump administration and continuing if the Trump administration lasts another four years will be to make into law as many of the administrative things that President Trump has done precisely to make it more difficult to undo them, both concerning Iran and concerning the effects on the PLO. Another factor is the Taylor Force Act, where right now the status quo is the PA is not receiving US aid because they've pretty much told President Trump that they're not going to meet with his envoys and they've rejected every peace initiative. But the Taylor Force Act actually by law requires one third of the aid to be cut if they continue to pay the slave policy. Hopefully everyone knows what that is. That's where they pay money to Palestinian prisoners or their families who have murdered Israeli. And the more heinous the crime, the more the prisoner or the terrorist family gets from the PA. Formerly European and US money was used for that. Right now it's European money, essentially. Uh, but fully with restoring it would probably not be an option under US law. I think that answers the question. He has some challenges in accomplishing that, but it looks like uh, he's gonna probably try. So we have to be prepared to fight him. Dan, one element of that question I was hoping to touch on, in, in the current administration, you know, the Taylor Force Act that you brought up, we, we're not seeing the Taylor Force Act as it was originally drawn up. It was parlayed and negotiated into what it is. So if the presumptive nominee who's making all these proclamations does wind up in power, would the same checks and balances apply in your estimation, given where we're looking to go in the next election? Well, it would be a challenge, as I said. Let me give you an example. So one of the changes to the original Taylor Force Act was for humanitarian exceptions. Who could be against humanitarian exceptions? So for example, there's a group called the Jerusalem Hospital Alliance, which sounds like a great group, and they do hospital care in the Arab parts of Jerusalem. Here's the problem. By exempting them from the US sanctions, which we have done in this law, that was a humanitarian exception. But there is nothing that stops the president and secretary of state from taking the entire amount of the aid and funneling it <laughs> through the humanitarian exception. It's only the goodwill. We know that President Trump isn't gonna do that. That would violate everything he's espoused on the issue. But are you sure that a Democratic Secretary of State, I mean, try to imagine who they might have, wouldn't take advantage of such a loophole to expand and essentially undo the original intent of the Taylor Force Act? It's a real, it's a real issue. Um, the entire, negotiation of the Taylor Force Act, unfortunately, we could go into an entire talk on that as well, was kind of an exercise in uh, seeing the best of good intentions going awry. The thing would have passed uh, without ever being changed from the original bill that had teeth. But APAC, frankly, wanted democratic equivalent support to make it bipartisan. And they literally weakened the bill in order to make it acceptable to Cory Booker, Senator Cory Booker, who was at that time a serious candidate for president. And uh, they didn't want to preempt him and place him on the other side of the issue and other senators like him. So they added a number of softening touches. And, you know, 
it still passed. We're still proud that it became law, but it's not nearly what it could have been. I think we're going to end up coming back to that, Dan, when you hear a question, a few questions down the road. Um, to, to move on, we're all aware of the debate over whether or not Israel should extend sovereignty over Judea and Samaria. ZOA, at ZOA, we've made our position crystal clear. Israel's sovereignty over Judea and Samaria is long overdue, and Israel should act now while there is a friendly administration in the White House. What role does the U.S. government actually play in this effort, Dan? There is a role for the American government. As you know, uh, the extension of sovereignty, what critics call annexation, and just to point out, if you don't know, we don't use that word because you can't annex what you already own. And we own this. Thank you. Uh, just to go through for a second about the background, again, I could have a whole hour on the claims to Judea and Samaria, but there's really three Jewish claims. The first is religious or biblical. God promised us the place. The second is under international law. Contrary to many pro-Israel people's position, international law does say that it belongs to the Jewish people and to Israel. But I'm not a big believer in international law, and I can answer questions about that. As you know, we've spoken about it before, Alan. But finally, by the rules of the way that the world works since World War II, as a practical matter, Israel physically controls it. And so as a practical, pragmatic matter, uh, they also are entitled to have Jews live there. After all, I like to say to people, Jews can live in, there's a town in Indiana, close to where I grew up, called Hebron, Indiana. Jews should be able to live in Hebron, Indiana, and they can in America. They should also be able to live in Hebron, Israel, where they've had a continuous presence until they were massacred uh, during the uh, years before the Israel was established. But there is a democratic party consensus emerging on trying to stop sovereignty. And there's something, here's the insider tip on this subject. The thing to watch is essentially propaganda that we will destabilize Jordan if we allow the sovereignty to go through, particularly in the Jordan Valley. The story is that King Abdullah of Jordan, who just actually threatened Israel last week in a, in a statement that he put out, which is just incredible. He literally is alive day by day because of the protection of Israel. For people who don't know, in 1970, Syria tried to invade Jordan and depose him. An Israeli military action convinced them to desist. So that was for his father, but he continues really uh, as a very weak guy only because of Israel's support. The worst thing in the world for him would be non-Israeli control of the border with Jordan. That would be extremely destabilizing for him. But the argument by people in Washington and, and some voices in Israel now is that we can only do this step extending sovereignty if it's seen by all players in the region to work. And the lie in this is, is easily seen if you saw the reaction to moving the embassy to Jerusalem. The naysayers said that it would cause the Arab street to erupt in violence, that every Arab country that was building a good, better relation with Israel would stop doing it. These all turned out to be untrue. So there's a window of opportunity and there is some infighting in the administration. On our side is Secretary of State Pompeo. And for some reason, potentially on the other side is Jared Kushner, who seems to be advised by people who have taken counsel of their fears. And there's kind of a tug of war between them. We think the president is on Pompeo's side. And right now, Israel has a green light as long as they accept the plan put forward by President Trump for peace to move forward with extending sovereignty. So from the American point of view, all of the conditions that have been set by Secretary Pompeo and President Trump have already been met by Israel. And the actual progress in the negotiations that they're willing to undertake is not required. So 
I think that if Israel wants to move forward, they will have the opportunity starting in July. That's what the coalition agreement allows. The question then is whether it's viable with Israeli domestic political considerations. And of course, ZOA is going to uh, recognize that the Knesset is the policy-making body for Israel. Unlike some of the critics on the left, we recognize that Israel is a democracy and they get to make that decision for themselves. I hope that answered the question. It actually does, and I see a couple of questions that might refer to that, so when we get to questions, we'll come back to it. All of us on, the, on this call are clearly focused on issues that affect Jews in Israel. And we all know that there are many, some refer to it as an alphabet soup of organizations that claim to work in the pro-Israel, pro-Jewish arena. Acknowledging that our ZOA positions on these issues can differ from those in our space, how does ZOA work with other Jewish groups on Capitol Hill? Well, you, you actually, actually, yeah, let me just, Dan, I want to just interrupt you. I knew we would come back to this when you were referencing APAC. So here's the stage is set where you can come back to how we do work with other groups. I wanted to talk about that more, actually, so I'm glad you did. You, it really is different. Let me just start out by talking about the thing that just happened, which everyone should know about on the Conference of Presidents decision. Just imagine a world where we didn't have Mort Klein as the head of ZOA and the entire episode would have played out differently. Most, uh, even Jewish organizations that agree with us would have passively allowed it to go forward. There would have been a little grumbling by one or two voices, but it would have uh, happened by consensus. So ZOA really does make a difference in that environment. I meet every uh, month or so with the Washington representatives of all the alphabet soup of Jewish organizations and, their, and we talk about the priorities. Um, someday I'm going to write a book, which would be a parody mm -hmm. from these meetings, because it will blow you away to hear what they say. We were at a meeting once with Senator Reid, who was then the majority leader of the Senate, and all these Jewish groups. And he asked the head of the delegation, this was when Iran was already a big issue, so about five years ago. And he asked them, what is the leading concern of Jewish Americans now? And without minimizing this concern, I, I literally had to laugh out loud. He said the plight of gays in Uganda was the thing that was most on the minds of American Jews at this time. So it was a, a, a ludicrous answer. And that's really not so far off from what is the common occurrence at these meetings. I constantly come back from them shaking my head. But there are good things. We do things with other Jewish organizations. I mentioned the Holocaust Education Act. Uh, it included a definition using the State Department definition of anti-Semitism. And uh, there was a Republican Senator, Senator Lee, who was putting a hold on the legislation last week. And we were asked uh, to help and see if we had any influence. And along with Senator Kramer, one of the sponsors from North Dakota, another Republican, they managed to talk him into dropping his uh, stay. In the Senate, a single senator can normally prevent a piece of legislation from moving forward without an extraordinary uh, vote. And it passed by a voice vote. So we do do things with other Jewish organizations. And when we do, you know, we're proud of that. But APAC is a special case. They're the big 300 pound gorilla, if I can say that in the room. Uh, they have their place. They, I'm sure there are people on the call who are involved with them. They do some excellent things and I praise them. But we are uh, constantly um, finding that uh, they place uh, an over priority on achieving bipartisan consensus to the point where it can actually weaken what Israel needs. And that's not something that ZOA is going to allow or uh, agree with. So when we have a choice between achieving a bipartisan consensus and not achieving uh, something and going off by ourselves, we're gonna do that by ourselves. Great, thanks, Dan. The last of my stock questions before we go to questions from the audience, Dan. We've spoken about several issues that you address in your role. Um, as ZOA Director of Government Relations, 
What can the people on our webinar, you know, the webinar participants, what can they do to help you in your work? And if you're comfortable touching on this, how do donations to ZOL, to ZOA help you in your work? Well, that's a really good question. These issues we've talked about today, if, if it's not one of the questions already, I, I almost always get this question when I speak, people say, you've, you've given us a lot of problems, but, but what are these solutions? And the answer is, there's no magic. I don't have a magic wand and neither does Mort Klein. <clears throat> All we can do is speak up and make the issues with your help make a difference. So what that means for each of the people on the call is you've got to evaluate yourself and what you're doing to help Israel and the Israel-American relationship and whether you're doing all you can. And what all you can means is are you spending your time appropriately? Have you personally reached out to your congressman or senator? What about your neighbors? When you're at a, if you ever get out of this shutdown, if you're at a party and someone says something about Israel having no choice but to give up territory if it wants to remain a democracy, do you speak up? Because that's an insane idea. How does Israel lose its democracy by not making a concession to the people who want to destroy it, to terrorists? So we all have to do that to speak up, to evaluate what our own priorities are. And there's a financial component as well. Um, I'm sure many of the people on this call already support ZOA and other pro-Israel groups, but we have a huge challenge and we need you to continue to do so and to do so in a quality way. What I will say, well, what do I do with, with more money? And, you know, it goes for sundry things like my salary, but don't, don't worry about that. It's not what I meant. What I really want to tell you is I have a strategic plan for the next five years. And one of the questions in that plan is, what can I do with significantly increased resources? And let me give you an example of something in that plan. Right now, you may have heard about this trip we talked about where the Arabs were gonna take um, these two horrible members of Congress to Israel. Well, AIPAC takes congressmen to Israel all the time. And ZOA should be doing that. Why? It's not that the AIPAC trip is bad, it's very good. They don't go to Judea and Samaria, except to meet with the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah. They should be going to Ariel, they should be going to the Jordan Valley. On the trip that the ZOA trip that I just took with Howard, if he's on the line, thank you. Uh, great ZOA trip, all of you. I see Roz and some others who are on the trip with me. Uh, there's no substitute for speaking with the people who reside for example, uh, in, the, in the Jewish community overlooking the town of Jericho, they have this beautiful view of the Dead Sea, and they have this beautiful view of the wilderness, of the, the hills, the high ground, that's essential for Israel's security. And we would love to bring congressmen there. And right now, to be honest with you, we don't have the resources to do it. So if I had a million dollars tomorrow that isn't in our budget, that's what I would push for. And that's the kind of thing that we can do and make a difference. Does that answer and your question? It does, Dan. And now we're gonna open the floor to some questions. Eitan Lior, you have first. I told you that I would get to you in the next call, so you're up, my friend. Eitan, can you unmute, please? Hello, Eitan, yeah. he's from Florida, to those of you who don't know him, and he's, he's personal friends with more congressmen and senators than I am. So, thank you. Give me, ahead. thank you. Just give me a couple of seconds to plug in the headset here. Hold on. We hear you. Okay, now it's good. You're better now. Thanks. Well, for, for real quick, since you mentioned Mike Lee, uh, I don't know if you remember, but then my first ZOA mission. This is not why I chimed in, but the first ZOA mission I attended in 2011, when he was just a newbie freshman. I brought him up to our meeting. I went to his office in the building. I grabbed him and he came up to our speaker at our briefing and you were there. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah. Um, just wanted to talk a little more. There was comments about the Demo some of the historically friendly Democrats. You mentioned Jerry Nadler, uh, Elliot Engel was mentioned in the chat and what they're up against right now. Thank you, Alan, by the way, also for getting, getting in here. Most um, welcome. So 
you mentioned what what they're uh, what they're all about right now. They're all a bunch of them are facing challenges from <clears throat> excuse me, a bunch of them are facing challenges from uh, well to the left anti-Israel Democrats who are funded by a group called Justice Democrats, which is affiliated with Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, and uh, Jerry Nadler is one of them. Somebody pointed that out in the comments, and also Elliot Engel's got one of those as well. Uh, Elliot's case, just very briefly, he has two challengers, so he may get out, he may get out of that race pretty well because they might split the vote. But um, they're going around the country, and I want to mention one other member of Congress who we just were about to lose because he lost his primary to one of these people, a guy from Illinois named Dan Lipinski, yep. who's been a good friend to us. And Dan Lipinski is in a very complicated district. He has, says he has the largest Palestinian population in the country if you accept that term, but I would call it Palestinian Arabs. Um, and he was primaried last cycle by a woman named Marie Newman, who lost to him by 2%, but she beat him this time. And in her one of her advertisements, which you may not have seen, Dan, she, spent, she had a three-minute video <clears throat> going around from mosque to Arab business to mosque, talking about Palestine and how she's not going to pander to special interests in Congress like APAC and other pro-Israel groups. And, and I'm just saying this because that's just kind of what we're up against. Sorry. That's just what we're up against right now. And so we're losing some of these Democrats' friends to, to uh, less friendly. They may not be as friendly as we like, but, um, but, you know, they're better than the alternative. I'm just mentioning it because that's kind of what's happening. They're just moving. The party is moving farther and farther away. I'm sure a lot of the people on the call know that. I just saw a message. I won't say who, but said Elliot's not a friend. I mean, he's arguably a friend, but... They're under a lot of pressure. So hey, can, can, can I ask a good time to, a question? I'm done, yeah, sure. It's a good time to answer that if anybody doesn't know, again, ZOA is a nonpartisan group. Absolutely. Sometimes people I'm get not... confused and they think that because we're so happy with President Trump, that we have to do everything we can to support him. But that isn't really the case. If President Trump tomorrow would come out with something that wouldn't be pro Israel, <clears throat> criticize him. Mort has done this in the past with other Republicans very often. And when a Democrat does something good, even Barack Obama, if you go back and look, some people have trouble believing it, but there were things he did, especially with defense cooperation, that ZOA lauded at the time. And we will continue to do that. There are many Democrats who are feeling this pressure. It's a very challenging thing. Imagine Elliot Engel, uh, supposing for the sake of argument that he really wants to not have Omar in his committee. Uh, he, he didn't, she's assigned to the Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, he could have probably made a big stink about it, but imagine the pressure that he would come under. The reality is whether we like it or not, the Democratic Party has a new constituency, which is a force. And, there, and the thing that we have to worry about now, and you're probably as involved in this as anyone, Ethan, is the Democratic platform is liable to be a real fight between the Sanders wing and the uh, traditional wing of the Democratic Party. To be honest with you, I wish, I wish we had more influence over making the Democratic platform less hostile, but I think it's gonna be a real fight and probably there's gonna be some unhappy things from our point of view in the Democratic platform. Hey, Dan, I'm gonna cut you short a little bit because we have a lot of questions to get to and yep. some really good ones. From, from David Kuttner, I've been, I've been to Congress with APAC for the past few years. What do you look for in someone who wants to participate in lobbying efforts? And uh, David lets us know that he's a slightly, a mostly retired attorney, so give him something to do, Dan. I, I want to, but let me just say, one of the most common fallacies is that you have to have something special to come to the lobbying mission or to be a lobbyist. Uh, every American is entitled by the First Amendment to lobby our elected officials. And we don't actually mm -hmm. require a great deal of previous knowledge. If you come on the mission, those of you who have been, that we have almost every year, this is the first year we haven't had it because of obvious reasons, uh, we educate you on the issues that ZOA is going to present. Let me just say another word about APAC. You said you've done the APAC. I've always been, it's such a waste. You have these thousands of people there and all of them motivated to do something for Israel. And then we ask these 
extremely minor asks. We ask for things that will pass no matter what. We ask for Israel to receive the foreign aid, which is not even controversial in this day and age. We ask for Israel's qualitative military edge, which is so much in the interest of the United States, there's nobody against it. And we ask for uh, missile defense, which almost every congressman is in favor of. It's such a waste. You know how much earlier we could have gotten the embassy moved to Jerusalem if APAC had been pushing it year after year? Think about it. it, it you know, don't forget, President Clinton signed the Jerusalem Embassy Act. And then from 1996 till this, this presidency, each president gave an every six month <clears throat> waiver. Could you imagine what we could have accomplished if we had had a concerted effort to get it moved earlier? Hopefully that answers the question. I want your help, so please do contact me offline about lobbying. I, and to, to David and anybody else, if you wanna be in touch with Dan, uh, certainly reach out to me at ajay at zoa.org and I'll put you in touch with Dan. Hey, Dan from Michelle Cut, from Michelle Locker. We have a very interesting question. You, you had what seemed like a throwaway line. I wasn't sure if I was hearing, but um, it was picked up by Michelle. And she says, wait a minute. Kushner is against sovereignty. Can you talk about that for a minute? Well, against is a strong word. Here's what happened. There's a certain amount of tea leaf reading going on here. And maybe, again, Itan may know some details that I don't. But the bottom line is he was tasked with, you know, making this Middle East peace plan. And when it first came out, <clears throat> the understanding overtly with Ambassador Friedman and with the president was that Israel could move forward right away at extending sovereignty once they accepted these conditions. And then we got a big stop sign and Kushner was the source of it. So we don't really know 100%. There's obviously a tug of war going on in the administration. It's strong to say he's against it. What is probably more accurate to say is that he wants to be cautious at implementing it in order to keep the idea of diplomacy alive. One thing I neglected to say is that the extension of sovereignty, some people say, how can you preempt the peace process? It's actually a precondition for successful peace. Because just as in the movement of the embassy, everyone knows on our side that the um, so-called settlement blocks, the neighborhoods around Jerusalem, and the big town of Ariel and the homes in the Jordan Valley are not being given up. Israel is never going to give those up, period. So any peace plan and any peace that anyone's gonna ever negotiate has to take that as a starting point. So when people say this is blocking efforts at peace, it's literally just the other way around without a clear eyed view of the fact that those territories are Israeli and are going to stay Israeli no peace progress is possible. Thanks, Dan. Uh, we have a couple of hands up and we have a little time. Ephraim Greenfield, could you ask your question? Sure, yeah. I was just curious, does ZOA get involved with uh, educating the public? Uh, you know, I find uh, even my friends that are in the Jewish community, they've even gone to yeshiva or Hebrew school or whatever it might be, and they're so ignorant of the history of the region. Uh, and that's amongst only just ourselves, but the U.S. population, et cetera. I mean, the, the reason is uh, I, I ask is because isn't it really a ma matter of presenting a moral ar argument with regard to Israel's position? And until you do that, until it's rather clear, uh, there's only so much we can get from uh, Congress, et cetera. Well, I agree with you on the merits. I will tell you that I have found that the, the more informed a person is on the actual specifics applying to both members of Congress, their staffs, and the general public, the more likely they are to be on our side. ZOA does do this, it's just not my department. So I, I know you've heard that as a bureaucratic answer. It's actually through Alan and Natalie who are also on the call that this question can best be answered. Well, I'll throw in there just for a moment, Ephraim, and I think we've probably had this conversation on the call. ZOA through its other divisions, the Center for Law and Justice, our campus division, uh, our senior folks like Mort and Mark, uh, Mort Klein and Mark Levinson, they write and we're all over the newspaper. We like to think that ZOA and our modality is all about education and Dan takes that for us into Congress 
And effectively, that's what he's doing. He's teaching Congress about uh, these truths. And I'll, I'll get a little bit more into that when I close the program. Um, Dan, here's one that's a little off, off the grid, but I think you're going to be able to handle it. It's from Robert Sklaroff, a friend of ours in, in Philadelphia. He says, how do you present Israel's behavior regarding Syria with particular attention upon whether it is felt to be desirable for Israel to recognize an independent Kurdistan? You got an answer for that? Yes. Um, first of all, hi, Robert. I, I know you from the, uh, the missions that you come down to every year. Uh, so Syria, the, the Kurds are a big problem in Iraq and Iran. Um, I'm very sympathetic to their national aspirations. Um, they're present throughout, also in Turkey, of course. Those are the three countries with the largest populations of Kurds. Amazingly, although they're mainly Muslim, they're pretty pro-Israel. They have an organized presence in Washington and they have uh, actively reached out to the ZOA and to me personally. And they've attended events and they are uh, really quite pro-Israel. Um, now the problem is there are a lot of different Kurds and they are disunited and uh, national divisions are you know, a big problem. Uh, Syria policy is very active. If anybody hasn't seen the news in the last few days, Israel is conducting a virtual war on the importation of Iranian weapons, weapons into Syria. The basic to make a long story short, the Iranians are tired of only attacking Israel through Lebanon with Hezbollah, and they want to establish another front in Syria. Israel is attempting to stop that from happening. It's a very active area. I don't know if I've answered the question fully, but it's a whole nother discussion, a 45 minute discussion, probably. There's a lot going on there and uh, it's actually could be the, the match that sits aflame, a conflict between Israel and Iran. Thank you, Dan. We have one more question with a hand raised and that's from Ruth Gray. Ruth? Hi, yes, hi. Thank you for everything you're doing. I just want to ask, What's going on with the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act? So remember we talked about the definition of anti-Semitism? That's actually the law that would make the State Department and the administratively applied by President Trump and, and even President Obama definition into a law so that it can't be changed. So the good news is there's a lot of support for it. The bad news is it's kind of sunk in uh, who gets credit for it. So there's a Florida congressman uh, on the Democratic side who originally introduced it. And he was kind of told in all this stuff with Omar and um, Talib that any issues that are going to divide the Democratic caucus need to be avoided and that he would slow, he should slow down the passage of that bill, which looked like it was going to sail to passage in the wake of the anti-Semitic attacks in Pittsburgh and California. But there's been a holdup, and now it's been reintroduced by Republicans in the House, and that's just a non-starter for the Democrats. So it's everyone's in favor of the bill, but it simply isn't moving. In the an additional obstacle is the Secretary of Education. DeVos is apparently not a fan of the bill. So we're not clear if that would mean that the president would object to it or what his position is on it if it should pass both houses. So there are some real challenges there. It's something we're pushing. Uh, the ultimate culprit here is the ridiculous argument that it's not in accordance with the First Amendment. Anybody can look at the bill and see it explicitly states and nothing in it uh, has anything to do with abridging free speech. And it is overtly in the bill and it is completely free. But that isn't the point of view of some other Jewish organizations. That isn't the point of view of the ACLU. Although I'm not sure why we should care what the ACLU says, but other Jewish organizations put a lot of stock in that. And so it's become controversial with the claim, wrong, false claim, that anti-Israel activism could potentially be punished 
even though it's permissible free speech. Nothing could be further from the truth. So we're fighting it. You know, to be honest with you, other than the coronavirus right now, a lot of things aren't going forward. Are you guys hearing me? Yeah, we're hearing you fine, Dan. Okay. Thank you. And I, I think we're about to be done, Dan, but before I close, I want to know if there's one more statement that you want to make. You've got about a minute. Anything on your mind that you'd like to share with people that are listening that you haven't been able to touch on? I could really use a trip to the bar and have a beer with my 30 closest friends, but that doesn't seem to be happening in Washington, D.C. in the near future. That's so I want to thank you all for listening and good questions. If I didn't answer any question that you had, um, you can go ahead and can I give them my email address? Of course. My email address is dpollack, P-O-L-L-A-K, at zoa.org. And I'm happy to answer any question. Sometimes if the, if the answer involves a lot of work, I might ask you if you're a ZOA member. So please, if you're not, become one. It's not an absolute requirement for pro-Israel activism, but I don't really understand people who aren't. So thanks. Thank you, Dan. Dan, thanks for your insight into our work and for giving the people on our, in our audience clarity on how ZOA makes sure all lawmakers on both sides of the political aisle know the truth about such important issues that you touched on just now, such as anti-Semitism in Congress, the future of PLO funding, pay to slay the watered down Taylor Force Act, issues relating to Iran terrorism, the JCPOA, Israel's sovereignty over Judea and Samaria, the current Trump administration versus a potential Democratic successor. To everybody listening to this call, <clears throat> please help Dan and ZOA dispel the myths and the lies. Help us share the truth. Everything Dan discussed in this past hour costs money. The more money ZOA has, the more resources we can allocate to fight for the issues we've been discussing. Please go to our website, zoa.org, and give what you can. Do your part to help Dan and ZOA secure a safe, sovereign, and eternal Jewish homeland. Uh, for those who can stay on, I'm going to read off the upcoming events that we have uh, in the next few days. On Tuesday, May 19th at 3.30, ZOA Philly and ZOA National present Zia's for Zionism, a children's book reading. On Wednesday, May 20th at 1 p.m., uh, book club hosted by uh, ZOA Director of Special Projects Liz Burney is going to host author David Lawrence. The book is The King of White Collar Boxing. On Wednesday, May 20th at 7 p.m., uh, ZOA Florida and ZOA National present Getting Justice for American Victims of Terror, featuring author <laughs> Stephen Perlis, interviewed by director of ZOA Center for Law and Justice, director Susan Tuckman, and moderated and hosted by Sharona Whistler, our ZOA executive director. And on Thursday, May 21st at 7 p.m., ZOA Philly and ZOA National present Ben Heck, Maverick Zionist with, Jess with journalist Jesse Tisch. Everybody, thank you for all of your support and your help. Thank you for joining us on Zoom with ZOA. We look forward to seeing you at our next program. Have a safe evening and be healthy.